is Krishna question. Where your objectives are pious, dharmic, but the means to achieve that sometimes can be compromised. So winning Mahabharat war was critical. And if that meant that Arjun has to kill Karna, the elder brother, so be it. After killing of Karna, Krishna tells Arjun that incidentally this is your elder brother because objective was to win the Mahabharat. Then there is Duryodhan question to where objects are adharmic, but the means to achieve those objects are, you know, right. So when he was fighting for his life, he didn't hit beam below the belt. But Bhim actually hit Duryodhan below the belt. And then there is Ravan question where objectives and means both are dubious. So as an entrepreneur, as a person, try to be in the Ram question all the time. But we are living in Kalyug and hence once in a while if you have to go to Krishna question, it is fine. But always avoid the Duryodhan and Ravan question. As long as your objectives are righteous and means to achieve those objectives bearing few exception is righteous, you will succeed. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Finance Forward, where we discuss finance accounts and everything that counts. Today I have someone very, very special. One of the greatest, if not the greatest, one of the greatest people in the financial market sector. He is chairman of the Mutual Fund Board in India. He is also an economic advisor to the Prime Minister. He is the MD of Kota, a gold medalist in the Chartered Accountancy back in the day and also a cost accountant. We, that we welcome Mr. Hilesh Shah on this podcast. Hilesh, thank you so much for thank you. presenting to do this podcast with us. It's a pleasure to have you. It's my uh, pleasure. I saw you in college back in yeah. 11 years ago. Now I can't believe that I'm doing this podcast. Just thank you again. So, uh, we, you know, the theme of the podcast is about talking to kids and uh, helping so we saw when we technical we not want to talk about more and more uh, technical terms so on the base level I want to start with something about your education back in the year you started with chartered accountancy we've read that chartered accountancy is one of the most cost effective programs but what we're doing today it has very little per se to do with the core ship tunnel cut years can you tell us a little bit about that? so one CA gives a professional degree and that's the cheapest degree available in most programs, you have to study full-time. CA is a part-time. You can earn and study. The foundation laid by CA is something which is even useful today. CA gives us all-round experience on accounting, taxation, management, economics, and so on and so forth. It also taught us how to understand balance sheets. Now, in the market, balance sheet is the first starting point. Correct. Back in the days, you know, when I was doing my articleship, many a times we used to ask client, kitna profit dikhana hai, kya kitna tax barna hai. So we were constructing balance sheets and today when someone constructs balance sheet, it comes naturally to us to figure out where things could have been wrong. So the foundation laid by CA is what is helping me even today. Obviously with time you have to change. And... Uh, one should remain a lifetime learner. Yeah, yeah. If you are a student of the market, you will write the market. Maybe you believe that you have become market guru and bigger than market. Your crash is inevitable. So how relevant is the accounting today's world? Well, you know, we keep seeing a lot of software take over. I mean, 30 years ago when you were doing your article ship, and that one time, it's not, the company was much more relevant than, the, the basics of accounting were much more relevant. I mean, they've been today, Taken them back with more analysis, you know, uh, there are software which enable, so on, uh, enable you to do this easier job. So, where do you see the pro- accounting profession heading in the next 10 to 15 years since you're one of the people who looked at macro from the top? So, yes, the technology is taking over the manual entry of accounting. But the knowledge of accounting will still be critical to present the state of affairs of a country or corporate or even an individual. And this is where a chartered accountant will continue to play a role. Uh, Back in the days, our accounting standards were fairly small. Our accounting was also simplified. Today we are seeing far more complex derivative transactions coming, far more complex 
accounting concepts come in. Uh, IFRS is one, I'm forgetting the acronym, but for uh, environmental, social and yes, governance yes. side, there is a reporting standard which, which is, is coming, coming into yes. play. So purely from entering accounting entries, you are migrating towards preparing reports or validation on ESG and on IFRS and so on and so forth. Uh, we are also becoming globalized. Correct. Our companies are raising money in global markets and they have to adopt to global standards. Again, CA will have a role to play. And finally, we are and we are becoming back office to the world. A chartered accountant will continue to provide accounting, auditing and taxation service to vast number of people all over the globe. So the transformation of accounting profession will continue to happen. But the foundation which is laid by Chattered Accountancy course will continue to equip you to manage the transformation. We're constantly uh, using evolution and technologies to stop doing what we were doing and understanding what, where we're headed in the next five years. Now, accounting as a whole, why I'm touching this about, upon it, and it's not only as, you, as your education, but up also the students who study accounting with us. They always have this question that will, will technologies just make sure that accounting goes away completely because auditing is different. They will accounting completely go away or, or with softwares and do you think that's essential so that we can do more research do, and more of analysis? So we really don't know what future is in store for us. We do know that the, uh, there is explosion of data. There is explosion of information. The processing cost has come down. The storage cost has come down. The connectivity cost has come down. Now, with this kind of lower storage cost, lower connectivity cost, lower processing cost and data, analysis will become important and critical. Uh, while a lot of accounting entries will be taken over by AI and, let's say, oh, programs, yeah. the auditing part, the analytics, analytics of it will continue to remain in human mind. And uh, people will have to keep open mind. What you are learning is the basic foundation. But you will have to keep on learning on top of it to remain relevant. An inquisitive mind and open mind will always be your edge. And yes, AI will bring a lot of processing power. But human intelligence also will coexist along with it. So one of the things which I want to teach up to sort of touch upon is research methodology. When you're looking at assuming investing or you're looking at India going in a different direction um, and you know we are, the G20 just ended um, India at this point in time is, a, is at a different high not only in the markets but in sentiment as well in uh, fundamentals also a little bit. Now when you're researching or when you're thinking about what do I do today to make sure what can I get to tomorrow that's also in the student's mind constantly about what it can help me. So can you tell us a little bit, little parameters on how if someone should research some fundamental things which will help a kid un understand what to do today for the next five years? Because again, after five years, things will change. So what is research? In market terminology, it is trying to identify what is discounted by the market. Market is a living organism. It continues to process information which is coming to you. It. And as a research analyst, my job is to one, analyze what market is already knowing and then trying to formulate a hypothesis as to how this information is going to move and will it be better than what is discounted by the market or worse than discounted by the market. Many a times we have seen a company declares a great result and stock prices go down. Why will that happen? It happens because market was discounting X profit. The real number came X minus 10% and hence, despite being a good number, markets corrected. Many a times we have seen opposite way. So one research is to figure out what market is discounting and second research is to figure out whether in your opinion, the actual numbers which will come will be better than forecast or worse than forecast. This is broadly the summary of research which one has to do. Now. I have seen that people who are not evolved, 
they need probably 15 page of research to justify an investment. People who are evolved, they probably need just the visiting cards back to figure out why one should invest into it. Research is not about extending Excel sheet. Research is not about trying to forecast future. Research is all about trying to figure out in the near term, what is discounted by the market and what's actual numbers going to be. And over the longer term, in which direction the company is going to move. So it's less about the numbers and more about the psychology. It's less about Excel sheet, more about the execution on ground. And what market discounts versus what you think will happen. If your call consistently goes right, you will make money. If your call doesn't go right, then unlikely that you will make money. So what should a kid do today, not just in his, you know, when he's starting to invest in financial markets, but overall in his career that tomorrow, so for example, should someone study? Uh... Keep an open mind. I know a friend of mine who was going on a honeymoon to Goa and while passing on Mumbai Goa Expressway, there is a steel plant. And he suddenly saw a huge traffic jam because there were so many trucks trying to enter that steel plant. That steel plant was shut and it was taken over by another company. And he could see that activities have blossomed. The road, because of the traffic, had worn down. Now, while on honeymoon watching this, he could figure out that this is stock to buy. I'll give you completely another example. We had invested in a newspaper company and the stock had given us five times return, we were very happy. Someone came and pointed out that if I look at the average advertisement in this newspaper for last seven days and then divide the total revenue earned on advertising by the number of square centimeter of the advertising space, they are actually charging more than Times of India, which is impossible for a small regional newspaper to do. Clearly, there is overstatement of revenue. Now, imagine we had spent enough amount of time talking with management and researching, but someone who had access to just last seven days of newspaper could do this analysis. Yeah. This kind of differentiated research, this kind of basic fundamental research is what's going to differentiate you. This is what's going to make money for you. So, an open, inquisitive mind which is challenging every number, which is trying to go behind those numbers to figure out how they are going to move and correlate that, that's going to make a huge difference. You know, we interestingly, uh, when, when you would come to college, um, we were studying this program called Bachelors in Financial Markets. And uh, we were supposed to actually learn about uh, how to probably you know look at investing because all of us who are there in the class we wanted to understand how can we invest, how can we put a buck in the market, and at least understand what to do or what not to do. Uh, we were taught the basic theoretical things in um, about market marketing terminology, but we were never really taught how to put how to call the broker back then, ten years ago, and place an order, or how do you open a demat account, or for that matter, what stock to pick. Now, one of the biggest tragedies, or rather, one of the pitfalls of the education system is is very very theoretical. So the the journey from theory to application is a big miss. So and and people who are coming out again from the uh, from from the companies are also equipped from from the schools are also equipped with the same knowledge that they do not apply. Now, what is your two cents on that? So one, if everything would have become simple, efficient, and easy, where is the arbitrage? Then there's no difference between you and the next guy on the street. I think. It's important that you have certain edge and that edge comes by knowing more than your competitor. Now, it could be knowledge about how to open DMIT account, how to place orders, how to invest. It could be knowledge about how to do research. It could be knowledge about how do I maintain my greed and fear. All of us are not going to be accomplished in everything. But all of us will have our edge and we have to play on that edge. Today I meet many kids who run Algo on their own okay. and they make money. I mean, great job. I have seen kids. Uh, so I have a 
I, I, I wouldn't call him friend, but we know each other. We studied CA almost around the same time. And uh, he became pure equity investor, didn't join any job. And he used to go to all the analyst meet of the company and meet them and learn about them. And over last 30 years, he would have gone to so many companies, their plant visits, their analyst meet, their balance sheet. And he's a very, very successful investor. By not doing any job, but by full-time pursuing this path of investment, he has done well for himself. So, all of us have certain skills. We have to leverage those skills to make money for ourselves. There's no one right way of success. Do what is suitable to you. So, now a little bit, again, I'm going back from the research and origin because that's back in the day when you were thinking about joining an LED and someone told you that, listen, probably look at financial markets or the bank or the BFSA saying, you took a leap of faith. Not only you must have done a little bit of your leading, you must have gone spoken to people. You, you, you thought, maybe let's try that option. It worked out really well for you. But again, what do you think the kid, I mean, sectors coming up in the next five, 50 to 20 years for people to look at alternatively work in or rather pursue a, a career in? So one... You know, I have always respected my seniors. If they tell me something, I believe their white hair gives them the authority to make those statements and I'll try to copy that. Second, we really can't forecast future with accuracy. But, you know, as the popular joke goes, if there are two people in jungle and they see a lion, you don't have to outsmart the line. You just have to outsmart the next person. Yeah. Uh, same thing is in career. You don't have to be the... You have to outsmart the next best competitor. The skills which will come handy for future, we don't know. It will keep on evolving. Someone was a great typist, but they may not translate into computer. Someone who is a great computer operator may not become good programmer and so on and so forth. So I recommend kids... Please keep an inquisitive, open mind. Learn uh, new skills as and when it comes. Like for example, today chat GPT is there. Figure out how to use it. There's no point in hiding from chat GPT. It's far better how do I master it and how do I start using it. People who use tools to create faster, quicker, simpler solutions will obviously outperform. People who keep their minds close-ended, they'll underperform. So keep an inquisitive, open mind. That's what is needed. Awesome. One of the things, again, um, about about not only research methodology, but um, overall is that if you look at, let's, let's talk a little bit about empirical data. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the econo- economy now. Um, this, this is what I have come to read in my little knowledge. Uh, that you know you look at the past also to understand what's going to happen in the future um that's what data analysis would essentially mean a little bit do you think where we are as an economy right now as a country right now was also something what china did 30 40 50 years ago and also looking at what china did 30 40 years ago in a way would help someone make a decision about where where india is going to be in the next 15 20 years not say maybe similar so while there are similarities between India and China, there's also vast difference. Yeah. China's track record on IPR has been fairly poor. India by and large has respected IPR. China's ability to execute is far, far superior to India. The difference between autocracy and democracy is going to stay. China is increasingly getting alienated from the world because of their behavior. India is increasingly getting assimilated in the world because of our behavior. So while there are many things to learn from China, I think their path to prosperity is different and our path to prosperity will be different. We are more comparable to the Western world where free market, open society, a democratic decision-making is creating a successful economic model. China, Singapore, 
Korea to some extent. These are all autocracies which have created a differentiated success model by doing many things which a democratic country like India will not do. So while we have to learn from China on many things, we, we must remember do, yeah. that we are two different sets of countries. Their path and our path has many, many differences. So what is the current, uh, I mean, maybe you said Western, Western uh, eco economies to look at. What would maybe a few economies be where we can learn from how they've executed really well? So I'll give you a very simple example. In the Great Depression era, the most valuable part of an individual's balance sheet was a piano. Every American kid, girl or uh, son will learn piano. There were thousands of companies making piano. Piano being bulky, there were trucks which were specialized in moving piano. There were piano teachers, piano coaching institutes, piano repairers. And it was the second most important part of an individual's balance sheet after house ahead of car. Okay. Now, 1929, Great Depression came. Khane ko paise nahi the, piano kya bachayenge? Immediately, everyone put piano on sale. Who will buy? Most of the piano manufacturing companies shut down. Most of the trucks which were carrying piano had to re-adopt. All the piano tuition teachers, coaching classes, repairers, 99% probably lost their job. And the skill which was acquired by playing piano was having no market value. What did America do? They did nothing. They allowed creative destruction. The piano manufacturing companies figured out what to do. Their land building factory was monetized and deployed in something else. The trucks moved to ferrying other cargoes. The tuition teacher became something else. The coaching center became something else. Essentially, through a painful process, all the resources of the economy were deployed from piano to something else. This makes a country successful. Look at India. Mumbai was Manchester of East. Uh, Lower Peril area, Elphiston area, Curry Road area, there were so many textile mills. And then they hit a downturn. Electricity was expensive, labor was expensive, transportation had become clogged. We needed to shift those mills outside of Mumbai. What did we do? We started nationalizing sick mills. Jobs of some of the mill workers was protected, but the capital deployed in those mills was wasted. Finally, what happened? In Phoenix Mill, a residential tower came, a big bazaar and shopping center came, St. Regis Hotel came, Palladium came, jobs got created. Looking at Phoenix model, every other mills, Empire mills, Kamla mills and other mills started developing their property. Today, Lower Peril has got the vibrancy. It has created jobs. Yes, some milk workers would have lost job, but their daughters and sons have got jobs. We delayed deployment of capital and did it under pressure when it was too late and hence our economy is suffering. How do we allow Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, Trimurti to operate in economy? Brahma will create. We have to encourage innovation. Vishnu will maintain. What Brahma has created, Vishnu will maintain. And finally, Shankar has to come and destroy yeah. In our culture, we respect Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh together. Same respect the economy has to give. The creative destruction will redeploy resources and create better opportunity. What America did with piano industry, if India had done with textile industry, our growth would have been far better. So you spoke about learning as a, as a, as one of the things. Um, learning, and you always say that you you encourage lifelong learning. You have to be a student of the market. You have to be a student overall in life. What, what do you do? How, do? how are you spending time in your schedule? And of course, because research and studying and reading probably would come a little bit more naturally to you or your job entails more and more of that. How are you spending your time uh, just learning? So when I was a kid, I used to go to library. And uh, this is the petit hall in Fort, yeah. So there was a petit hall and there was one uh, library in Kalba Devi Road which was nearer to my house. So I used to go there and spend entire day. 
I didn't have money to buy newspapers. So I used to borrow newspaper from my neighbors. I used to get Chitra Lekha. One of my neighbor used to get Chitra Lekha and before he will leave for his home taking Chitra Lekha, I'll finish it off. Uh, we had a Bhilwala Dukan downstairs and he used to get a lot of Raddi. So I used to go and read it from okay. there. Essentially, I realized at very early age that if I have to expand my horizon, I have to read. And not having money was not a sufficient excuse. There are many public libraries, there are many Raddiwalas and there are many kind neighbors who will provide you enough. Uh, all throughout I was reading Gujarati and Hindi, very little English. One day I realized that I have no option but to study English and I started reading English. Uh, when you show dedication, then you know things also start falling in yes, place. Yeah. So I didn't have money to buy books and hence I used to borrow it from library. And my librarian was so nice that he will actually give me various books at various point of time saying that you read this, you read this, you read this. Now, I showed some dedication and then someone supported me. All throughout I have seen that if you show dedication, knowledge is available. Today, I have luxury of buying whatever book I want to buy. There are so many people who gift books to me because they know I am interested in reading. I am part of uh, WhatsApp groups where people share knowledge. Even on social media, I follow certain people to, you know, get their share of knowledge. Essentially, it's a thirst. You have to show dedication. You have to show inclination. And then to, in today's world, there are many, many opportunities. Yeah, knowledge, is, knowledge is free at this point of time. It's free. Yeah. It's infinite. Yeah. So do you think at this point of time, because we literally, you didn't have this back then, but I mean, you still had to maybe slog it a little bit more. But today's world, when knowledge is so free, so available on the tips of your phone, do you think at this point of time, it's even more easier for someone to succeed again with dedication with the right support and everything with, with resources available money is more easily available credit lines are there i mean the ecosystem is there infrastructure is much better than what it was you think today if a kid's not or whoever he or she not a young entrepreneur if they're not able to succeed it is one of the biggest uh you know what, what do we say it's, it's on him more than him he can blame it on his ecosystem see i mean Every generation feels that the next generation has got everything and our generation was struggling. But uh, I think today's generation have their sets of challenges. We had our sets of challenges. But the trait of a successful person is someone who didn't blame outsiders, who always tried to improve itself. Second, people who are successful are generally team builders. I mean, yes, someone can become a very successful author or a successful player. But by and large, successful businessmen are one with a team. Third, lifelong learners have generally done better than someone who just shuts his mind. Uh, there are research which suggests that even luck is, you know, not divine. It is something which you create through your networking. So, I guess... The success is a function of your skills as well as your networking. And in today's world, that's slightly easier compared to what we had in the past. But then there are challenges which this generation has to face which were not existing earlier. Okay. But I think the formula for success continues to remain very, very simple. Uh, one advice which I got from my boss saying that there are four quotient in life. One is the Ram quotient, where your means and your objectives both are of very, very noble, pious variety. You don't compromise on your objectives and you don't compromise on means to achieve those objectives. They are noble. Then there is Krishna quotient, where your objectives are pious, dharmic, but the means to achieve that sometimes can be compromised. So winning Mahabharata war was critical. And if that meant that Arjun has to kill Karna, the elder brother, so be it. After killing of Karna, Krishna tells Arjun that incidentally, this is your elder brother. Because objective was to win the Mahabharata. Then there is Duryodhan question to where objects are adharmic. 
but the means to achieve those objects are you know right so when he was fighting for his life he didn't hit beam below the belt but beam actually hit duryodhan below the belt and then there is ravan question to where objectives and means both are dubious so as an entrepreneur as a person try to be in the ram question all the time but we are living in kalyug and hence once in a while if you have to go to krishna question it is fine but always avoid the duryodhan and ravan question as long as your objectives are righteous and means to achieve those objectives bearing true exception is righteous you will succeed you spoke a little bit about team building and i want to understand a little bit about how you as a leader i mean your leadership style a little bit but more importantly how you get teams together to understand what is the cause you're working towards so what do i expect from my boss i want him to be appreciative of my effort when i make mistake he should be able to cover it up and support me through that phase he should be there to remove my hurdles he should be there to support me where i need where i can't open the door he should be able to help me open the door this is what i expect from my boss the same thing my subordinates expect from me they want me to be appreciated i have to be appreciated they want me to help opening the doors which they can't open on their own that's why i am their boss they also want me to uh, you know give them responsibility as well as accountability if i give them only responsibility and no power how will they work so my leadership style has evolved over the years earlier i used to fire people quite heavily and then i realized that's not the right way today whatever i expect from my boss i try to deliver that to my subordinates am i perfect model answer is no but uh, as long as i'm aware that i am dependent upon my team and my success or failures will be function of how i deal with my team by and large teams deliver by and large they work and uh, most importantly it is the trust each person is different in the team there are some people who just need a nudge there are some people who need guidance and support there are some people who needs to be pushed yeah. there are some people who can be just left on their own and you just draw the boundary within that he'll continue to play so you try to customize your behavior with each individual but on an average you lead the team by example uh if you do what you are telling them to do then the confidence comes saying that okay if my boss can do it i can also do it if my boss can deliver so can i so limited summary whatever you expect your boss to be you try to be similar boss to your subordinates <laughs> easier said than done to be very honest yes but uh, if you remember that then you know many a times in your behavior that comes at the back of your mind i have to try a lot now <laughs> <laughs> uh a, a few more questions uh if i may a little bit more like you you're running a very large mutual fund house you're managing people's money um and it does come with a lot of pressure uh, i know you really love your job but still it comes with pressure because you're dealing literally with people's saving um how 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 are you able to manage that not only are you supposed to well, people are expecting you to multiply it uh increase it because it might be that they're thinking about this as a retirement plan for them uh how are you handling that bit so in the initial phase you know i felt the burden of managing people's money and over the years i have seen that losing money is not necessarily what makes people feel bad about you but if i'm not able to explain why i lost money that's where people lose in 2008 we had lost a lot of money for our clients but we could go and meet them and explain why did that happen and why this is a temporary thing and not a permanent thing most people ended up giving us more money 
so my business is about managing okay. trust as long as i communicate right thing as long as i follow the process which i have communicated people are willing to take risk with the result we are in the business of not money management but trust management as long as people trust me they will give me money and they will live with my underperformance or under delivery because they know i am following right process outcome is not in my hand right. but the process is in my hand and i need to give confidence to my investors that i am following a process yeah. they are severed wahan pe return ban jaye correct so it's basically following the right Absolutely. stick to your call the intent is right the messaging is right the process is right outcome is in the hands of god but no one will doubt about my integrity no one will doubt about my effort yeah i can give confidence on integrity and efforts yeah. and then outcome is in god's hand yeah so probably one of the best messages of this is that stay true to what your vision is mission is don't compromise like you said be the ram uh maybe be the krishna but once your name gets spoiled i, I mean it's just very difficult for people to believe you again you okay. said we even keep calling people but i mean it's not going to it's short term but short termism is very prevalent today i know but as they say you can fool someone all the time you can fool all the people sometime but you can't fool all the people all the time uh, i think investors are smart they are able to differentiate intent and effort versus outcome and as long as you have done a rightful job on intent and efforts i think people are smart enough to recognize that so you're you're doing you're the chairman of mfe that that entails a lot a lot of job a lot of time you're also running a big fund house uh you're i'm um, you're you're the economic advisor to the prime minister you're reading your personal life where are you, how are you managing your time because for kids because they get so overwhelmed with what they're doing right now they should look at you and say i mean we're doing little less because every time i'm thinking that bahut zyada kaam ho gaya best we at that point of time it kicks in that you know there are people who are doing far more than me and they were creating well, bigger companies and we i must respect the fact that i'm not at that stage yet so i can't complain about it so one you know managing time is all about being in present yeah when i'm doing this podcast i'm here i'm trying to do justice to the best of my ability if there are any learnings i'll note it down and use it for the next podcast second i have a team which supports me on all the work which i do i try to delegate as much as possible in some sense my job as ceo is a firefighter whenever my team faces a fire i should be there to support them yeah. otherwise they should be able to manage on their own having a good team with empowered empowerment it's a big uh, success you make 1 plus 1 11 rather than 2 Two. because yes. there is a force multiplier so time management yes it is challenging when you have so much on your plate but thanks to the team at office at home you are able to do things awesome and i'm um, probably last question which i've been dying to ask you how is it working with prime minister modi so one clearly he has a vision for the country he truly wants to take india to a developed nation and with that vision there is unbelievable execution it is execution which is at the fore so one there is vision and second there is execution execution without vision is useless vision without execution is equally useless you need both vision and execution to come together and here is a prime minister who doesn't take any holiday he probably works 16 18 maybe 20 hours a day and you know he's there in the ram question and probably sometimes in krishna question never in duryodhan and ravan question so it's an honor to work with him in ramayana when they were building the bridge setu to sri lanka there were giant apes and bears and other people who were building it but there were squirrels also who were taking small stones Stone, and yeah. putting it the apes and bears complained to ram that you know the squirrels are coming in our way and ram said that respect their feeling 
even they are helping you build the bridge by putting small small stones in between so that large stones remain stuck i think prime minister modi is building that samudra setu from underdeveloped india to developed india and we are all the squirrels who have to go and put the stones to the extent of our ability will it help build a big bridge i don't know but at least i know with satisfaction that i have contributed to the extent of my ability if 140 crore indian starts believing in that and behaving like that i don't think so any bridge is difficult for us to build awesome this is great i mean i think uh, role model and what not but i mean thank you so much for doing this uh, truly one of the greats if not the one point if not the greatest person in the industry uh we'd love to keep speaking to you um any many message for our students at all so we are lucky to be born in today's india yeah. it's transiting you know from an underdeveloped economy to a developed economy what we have seen in last 20 25 years far more we will see next 20 25 years and as citizens as uh, part of this journey i think we are truly lucky and blessed in front of our eyes we will see india becoming a developed nation and there will be tremendous opportunity with the person who is optimistic about future and who is participating in this growth story so stay back in india no no more brain drain i think this is a fantastic place to be i truly believe it i, yeah. I and uh, again thank you so much for doing this nilesh sir thank you. you thank you